Sheffield, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. We're in a small white room in this is Oxford here. So shall we? Hi, Oxford. Part of the room. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Um, we have a new, we new return to this event. Hello. Hello. Sorry. Nicole, call, unfortunately, Cole can't make it this week. I don't know if he's emailed you. Okay. But if not, I'll email you later. Yeah. You're a little bit faint. My my um laptop you... microphone's really bad. Oh, oh no. oh, that's a lot better. That was a lot better. Okay, I'll just talk a bit louder. Thank you. Um okay. yeah, obviously the recording if you want to listen to it. Okay. So uh Hello, Samantha. She's muted. She's muted. We're all a little bit early. Mm -hmm. Move a bit. Do you want to? You don't mind not being in sight in chart, do you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to need that. Okay. You can, um, you can. Let's get it as well. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> yeah, we will. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> what we yeah, 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 we're upside down. Like, what is Sheffield doing? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, we have, we have, we have, we have, we have, we
Hello. Hmm. Hello, who's that just joined? Oh, hello. This is Audrey, Audrey Cox. Hi, Audrey, how are you? This From is... Paul. Hi, Audrey, nice to hear you. And you. <laughs> Perhaps I'm. Perhaps I sh should have waited a few more minutes. Oh, don't worry. No, there's a few people just joining. We're gonna. We're a bit early, actually. Okay. Um, I tell you what. I'll call call you back in about five minutes if you okay. like. Yeah, sure. Talk to you. If soon. that suits you, yeah. Okay. It's just that I've got a family in the in the kitchen and they're making okay. a noise. I'll call you in five minutes. Bye bye. 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 Hi, Richard. Hi. Let's turn the video on again. How's everyone doing? Well, thank you. You? Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah. Taking a while for people to join today. Yeah. Um, still got a few minutes to go, I think. Yeah. Uh. <clears throat> Are you hoping other people join from London or? Yeah, I think I know there's a few coming on, hopefully. Um, yeah. Great. Hi, Carrie. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great. I'm going to put myself on mute. Good evening. <laughs> oh, got it. I will do it. I'll do that right now. No problem. Bye. Somebody who's lost the link. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Hi, Aaron. Hello. Are we on? Hi. Oh, yeah. Hello. Hello, Paul. How are you? Hello, fine. Hi, How fine. Are you? Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> I'm applying for much home code. I'm my green on it. Because it's been so good. I think we've got you now, David. Hi, oh, yes, we've got three of us here in Oxford. <laughs> Hi guys. Hey, Hi, Jim. 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 Come on. <laughs> Hello. Welcome, Murray. This is Aaron. Oh, and everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see no, you. It's fine. It's no, fine. it's all right. <laughs> How are you doing? Yeah, very good. Very good. It's been a really busy week. Hi. Let's get this thing up. Hello. This is Amber speaking. Oh, hello. Hello, hello, hello. hello. Oh. Oh, hello, it's Audrey Cox here. I'm part of the pool group. Hi, Audrey. Hello. Audrey. Hi, it's Cathy and the Edinburgh group. Hello, Hi. Edinburgh. I recognise the area code. Hmm.
was just talking. just a reminder if you're dying if you're on the internet uh it be, it's always good to pop yourself on mute if you're on the phones and you can't find the button on your phone i think it's star six and unmute yourself um Della, you'll correct me if that's wrong i assume sounds right to me right also if people are struggling to mute themselves i can also do it from here so <laughs> Nice to shout out though. <laughs> right, we have a lot of lines on. We've got 18 lines on the call, and some of those look like rooms that are full of people. Um, so that's good. Um, I'm going to give it 30 more seconds as we've just gone on the hour, and some people may be joining a little late. So 30 more seconds, and then we'll kick off. All right, let's call it 20 seconds. Um, right, let's get going. Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Results National Grassroots Conference call for March. Um, I've, uh, we've had a bunch of people introduce themselves already on the call, but let me introduce myself if we haven't had the chance to meet. My name is Aaron Oxley. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of Results UK. Um, just want to give the opportunity for anybody else who's maybe new to the call to introduce yourself or say hello. Uh, I'll pause for a second in case there's anybody that wants to do that. Um, I, I, I heard Sheffield. Uh, without, oh, Christopher. Hi, Christopher in Sheffield. Welcome to the call. Good to see you. Is anybody else wants to say hi? Please, I'm new to Oxford. Good to have you. Good to have you. Uh, last call. Okay. okay. Right. Um, so let's jump into the call. Um, as I always do on these monthly calls, I'll just start with a quick overview of what's going on in the world and in politics that could affect our work here at Results and as we work to overcome global poverty. Um, so for those of you that are on last month, you will, may recall that I started my remarks on the topic of Brexit and this month I'm afraid I have to do the same again. Um, now whatever our personal views are on the topic, it is a reality and this week negotiators from the UK and the EU met to get the ball rolling on the trade negotiations that look like they're going to form a big part of the political agenda for the foreseeable future. Now as I flagged last month, um, this call is all about that. Uh, we're going to hear how it could have a direct effect on the resources that are available to develop new treatments diagnostics and vaccines that really work against tuberculosis or TB. Uh, these are tools that we desperately need. Uh, as many of you know, TB is the world's biggest killer infectious disease. It kills more than 1.5 million people uh, in 2018. That's more than 4,000 people every day. And that's why it's been a long-standing campaign issue for us at Results UK. So, how and why this risk to TB research and development resources exists is going to be explained by our guest speaker a bit later on. Um, we've set this out in the action materials we sent you last week by email, but our guest speaker is going to get into this into a little more detail about what, what is a comparatively niche, comparatively complicated area of policy. But one thing we know for sure is that the results grassroots network is more than capable of taking this on. Um, but before we get into all of that, um, let's not forget that whatever we choose to take on any issue, for us, it's all about our mission to overcome global poverty by 2030. Whether that's about access to health, education, or economic opportunities for people living in poverty, or who are marginalized for whatever reason. As we know, health is a vital building block for individuals, families, and communities. For diseases like TB, which affects the most marginalized communities, the worst and the most, having appropriate treatments that reach where they are is really, really vital. So that's why we're tackling this issue of funding research and development into fighting tuberculosis this month. So next, um, I wanna thank everyone who's taken our recent advocacy actions on the need to protect the work of DFID, uh, on the UK support for global vaccination programs and for its support on the fight against malnutrition. In a minute, we're gonna hear from Della about the impact you've been having on these topics. I wanna say a bit about the first of these, the work of DFID. Now, since we first asked you to take action on this, 
we've had the latest cabinet reshuffle. And the big news and the good news is that we still do have an international development secretary. That's really positive outcome. Uh, some people didn't expect that, uh, but we, we, we do have one which is great. Um, it's a new person, the new Secretary of State is Anne-Marie Trevelyan, uh, is, was appointed on the 13th of February. You can read on the government website about who she is and one thing's for certain, results will be welcoming her into a new role as we have regularly with her predecessors over recent years. Just for the record, she is the sixth Secretary of State we've had in the last four years. So you can rest assured that we're gonna be doing all we can and we know that you'll be doing all you can to inform her about the incredible opportunities she has this year to make the world a better place, ensuring an effective use of the UK's international development budget to help fund things like vaccination for all, adequate nutrition, uh, and tuberculosis research and development. Now, one thing you may have noticed is that the seven ministers in her department, up from two uh, previously, they're now all shared with the Foreign Office. And some people are seeing this as an indicator that the departments are gonna be fully merged later this year. Now, the Telegraph recently quoted a source as saying that this would be a conclusion of the review of the UK's foreign policy that's due later this year. However, former Secretary of State Andrew Mitchell wrote in the same newspaper of the importance of continuing to have a separate effective department for international development. The truth is we don't know what will happen but we'll be trying our best to ensure that DFID remains independent. We can assume that politics is gonna to continue to be fast paced. And for those of you who still want to take action on this very important debate, there is everything to play for and we'll be keeping uh, you up to speed and involved. So that's it for me right now. Um, I'm now gonna hand over to Della as usual to give you the roundup of all your advocacy activities around the UK in the last month. So Della, over to you. Thank you, Aaron. Um... So last, since we last spoke on the monthly call, um, we've had the Gavi Advocacy Day on the 12th of February, um, which was amazing. We had 16 results advocates join um, and about 80 others from other organisations, including one, Save the Children and others. Um, and lots of us met with our MPs for the first time. Um, and it was just amazing to see you all in action. I hope you found it a good experience. Um, it resulted in five of the nine MPs that we met with on the day signing on to a letter to the Prime Minister, um, asking for the UK to maintain the 25% share um, of the funds needed for Gavi over the next five years. Um, other MPs agreed to write personal letters um, and other activities, including Matthew Offord, who is in London's MP, who submitted a written parliamentary question after they met as well. So we're keeping, out, keeping an eye out for the reply on that. Um, the Macclesfield group also got their face oh, okay. express. Um, well done guys. Um, I put a photo of that in the closed Facebook group, um, if you want to check that out. Um, Thanks also to Richard and Sophia from the London group who helped organise a really nice social afterwards. Um, yeah, it was really nice to see people socialising with volunteers from other organisations and staff as well. I wondered if anyone on the call wanted to pitch in and say anything about how they found the advocacy day um, or had anything to add at all. No pressure, if not. Uh, yeah, why not? So... Uh, my MP is Matthew Offord, so hello everyone, I'm Keisha from London, and uh, the advocacy day itself, so the actual layout and structure today was really, really amazing in terms of um, in the morning we just got um, sort of training and advocacy, it told us about Gavi, um, one natural work that they do, and then in the afternoon uh, we got the chance to of course meet our MPs. And it was really fantastic in the sense that some of the MPs turned up at the very beginning and others um, turned up at the very end. So uh, my MP, Matthew Offord, turned up about half an hour, I believe it was, until the end, uh, half an hour before the end. And he seemed really enthusiastic, um, signed the letter and, of course, uh, resulting in not one but two parliamentary questions being put forward. So... Uh, definitely successful day. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Peter. I think your perseverance definitely paid off. He wasn't an easy person to get hold of on the day, but <laughs> you pestered him until he had to show up, and it definitely was worth it. So thank you. Oh, for sure. 
Um, I've got some really nice photos from the day as well. So um, I'll put a link in the chat box if you want to see the photo album um, from that. Um, so just as well on Gavi, thanks to everyone else outside of the Advocacy Day who's been meeting with their MPs on Gavi and also different independents, um, which was the January action. Um, sorry, I'm just showing somebody who is, here we go, sorry. Um, yeah, so thanks for letting me know all the meetings and letters you've been sending on Gavi. I know Cathy and Edinburgh has been really busy. Um, Tommy Shepherd, her MP, agreed to write to the Secretary of State after they met. Um, and he's also received a positive response back from Diffid Minister Wendy Morton, MP, uh, just reassuring that they're taking the summit seriously um, and will help mobilise the funds needed for the next five year period for Gavi. Um, Tommy also went a step further and asked a couple of really great written parliamentary questions on Gavi and the government strategy for ending preventable deaths by 2030. So, Again, keeping an eye out for an answer on those. Um, also in Birmingham, Steve McCarb, who's David's MP, tabled a written question about um, re retaining the independence of DFID. So just amazing work. Um, your meetings are definitely paying off. And yeah, it's really nice to see that result in some parliamentary activity. Um, and just, yeah, thanks again. Um, in terms of the February action on nutrition, I know lots of groups have been sending letters to the Secretary of State, um, whether it was Alok Sharma just before it was Anne Trevelyan. Um, they will both have received some great letters, so thank you. Um, and I know you've been getting quite similar responses back from, from the DFID nutrition team basically responding in, in Anne-Marie's place, um, which is not really giving us any really new information but it's still really supportive and we know that DFID are kind of on our side with this so yeah fingers crossed for a, a strong pledge for nutrition for growth um so just lastly a couple of dates i wanted to mention um so we've got a training coming up on saturday um in london it's not too late to sign up if you're still interested to come um we'll be looking at the interconnectedness interconnectedness of the sdgs that we work on as results and learning some really practical organizing skills to help you link up with others in your local communities um, in terms of campaigning. Uh, we've got a really great speaker and campaigning expert coming in to speak to you all on that. Um, and we're also hoping to be joined by two youth leaders for nutrition from Zambia and Rwanda who are in the UK for an advocacy tour. So visas dependent. Um, we know we have one of them, hopefully we'll have both. And we're also going to try and have a kind of relaxed social a pub nearby so if anyone is coming and is interested to hang out for a couple of hours afterwards just let me know and i'll try and make sure we book enough space um as usual we can support your travel down to london if you're coming from further afield so just let me know and i'll help arrange it um and i'll put a link to the event in the chat box as well um and the very last thing is the national conference date which is coming up on the 6th till the 8th of june um, in London. I'm hoping to have a ticket link live by the end of the week or early next week so that you can book on but until then save the date. Um, it's, for those of you who are new and have not been to a conference before it's a really nice opportunity for the whole network to come together for talks, workshops, training and just to socialise as well. Um, so yeah more details to follow. Um, just drop me an email if you've been taking campaign actions and I don't know about it yet. It's always good to be kept in the loop. So yeah, thanks again for all your hard work and I will speak to you all next month. Back to you, Aaron. Thanks so much, Della. <clears throat> Goodness me. Um, thanks for that. And now, so let's kick straight into the topic of tonight's call. You'll notice we've kept our remarks a little shorter this evening to give us time to really grapple with this issue. Um, uh, and I think there's fewer people better placed to uh, talk about it tonight. Uh, the now guest speaker. It's really my pleasure to introduce a fellow results staff member. Um, she is our senior policy advocacy uh, uh, officer on tuberculosis, Rachel Hoare. Some of you will have met on our December conference call. Uh, she leads for results on engaging policymakers such as civil servants and, and international civil, uh, civil servants as well with her TB advocacy. And she's a real expert when it comes to research and development for TB. 
She's also been a real leader when it comes to accountability, including doing a bunch of work globally coordinating uh, advocates to ensure that world leaders keep the promises that they made in New York in 2018 at the UN high level meeting on TB that some of you will remember. And those include a bunch of promises on research and development funding for TB. You also may have seen Rachel's recent report on how, on how TB treatment must be integrated fully into health services in order to help deliver on universal health coverage. Uh, if you want to have a read of that, um, you can find that on the publications list on results website. Uh, now, Rachel, I saw you joining earlier. There you are. Do you want to say a quick hello? Oh, I'm uh, on mute. Um, <laughs> hello everyone. Um, glad to be on the call with you all tonight. Um, I'm very excited about this this month's action. So great. So uh, Rachel, um, uh, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, that we often ask people to do. Uh, uh, sorry, one of the things that we often do is introduce people to the network. I think you don't need introducing to our network. You know a lot of them already um, and, and so on. So I won't do that. Um, but while, what I will do is I will ask you to introduce yourself, um, say a little bit about what you do uh, in terms of your role. And then also maybe some remarks about what got you into this work and what motivates you to work on TB advocacy specifically. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Um, so as Aaron explained, I'm the Senior Policy Advocacy Officer at Results for TB, um, which includes engaging with uh, civil servants across government departments like DFID, Department of Health um, and the Cabinet Office um, to, to, to try and add, to influence the UK's um, actions on TB, whether it's research and development funding, um, but also their engagement with international processes that might impact the global response to TB. Um, for example, at the UN or the World Health Organization, um, but also at forums like the G20 um, in their health discussions. Uh, Previously to results, I worked at Médecins Sans Frontières, um, MSF, um, and that's how I kind of got into TB. Um, like many people, I didn't really know anything about it or that it was really um, kind of still a problem <laughs> before working there. Um, and yeah, after spending a couple of years, um, I had a role at MSF um, working on HIV and TB um, and then saw this roll it results, which seemed perfect um, for me. Thanks, Rachel. We're very, very pleased to have you. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I think there are, there are very few people that are working um, with the degree of insight and specificity that we have uh, in Results UK on this issue. I think some of our partners, for example, are in Germany. We work with a German organization called DSW. Um, I know that you're in regular contact with them, but, but really, as I said, um, this, we're giving all of you Results Advocates a, a real inside view into a, a really important uh, but under, uh, under understood is that even a thing um uh, aspect of the fight against tb uh, please forgive my making up words uh but let's let's kick into um the calls for tonight um uh let's let's jump straight in um for grab your pencils though because i'll let you know the number for texting questions and um you can put questions in the chat box as always for those of you on computers uh, for those of you uh, not on computers and able to text in, um, the number tonight is 0777 56 1178. That's 0777 56 1178. Uh, and of course, we'll do the usual unmute and yell out uh, for those that don't have either of those facilities as well. And it's good we're starting 40 minutes to go. We should really be able to dig into this. So we've got a few pre prepared questions. The first one uh, comes from. Manchester. Do we have Manchester on the line? I think we're expecting Hunter, but I can ask the question. Oh yeah, no, I can see you. Sorry, go ahead, Hunter. <laughs> Hi. Um, why is research and development into tuberculosis still needed? Um, so I think Aaron covered a little bit of um, well, the first part of the, re the reason it's still needed. And that's just because of the huge burden of TB around the world, um, infecting around 10 million people per year um, and killing 1.5 million. That's in 2018 alone. Um, that's more deaths than HIV and malaria combined. Um, and progress against the 
sustainable development goal to end TB by 2030 won't be achieved for another 100 years. And a big reason is because we don't really have the tools, the necessary tools to, to, to combat it effectively. Um, for example, um, the only vaccine against TB, the BCG, which I'm sure many of you have had, um, was developed nearly 100 years ago and is only partially effective. Um, on diagnostics, um, there's no point of care diagnostic um, that delivers rapid results um, that exists. Um, so that means when health workers are out kind of in very remote areas, they don't have the tools they need. People have to go to a, a hospital or health center, um, which means about 30% of those 10 million cases are never even diagnosed um, per year. And the treatment itself, if people do get on treatment is very long um, for for regular TB, it's six to nine months. And for drug resistant TB, which I'm sure many of you know about, it's up to two years. Um, and this treatment can be quite grueling. Um, and well, and only a third of people are enrolled on this with drug resistant TB. And the success rates of, of being cured are, are very low, um, around 50%. Um, but at the moment, I think it's an exciting time in, in research and development for TB. So it means that sustained kind of funding and increased funding is really necessary to get some really promising um, new tools to where they're, to where they're needed. Uh, for example, in, there's the most exciting breakthrough in vaccines research than for, for a century. Um, and that is going into its final phase of, of trials. Um, the, the, pipeline of new drugs is healthier than ever um, and they need to be taken through to, to phase three or final final stage trials um, and there are many new guidelines um, to improve treatment um, which in, in, which require research to kind of make sure they're actually rolled out in in countries thanks Rachel um, really really clear um, I think uh, that is one of the really sad things in TB is that we don't have the the drugs, diagnostics, and vaccines that we really need. Um, we really need, do need uh, better ones, although it is really promising where we're at right now. There are lots of things in the pipeline that we need to get over the line, um, which I think segues us very nicely into our second question, which is going to come from London. Yeah. So hi, Rachel. Uh, in terms of the EU, actually. How does the EU help the fight against TB? So the EU is playing a really vital role in, in research and development for uh, new tools to fight TB, um, both in terms of mobilizing funding, but also coordinating research and coming up with the best kind of policies to, to, um, to coordinate the, the research. For example, um, well, they actually play a role in, in all three things I just mentioned, diagnostics, vaccines, and treatments, as well as strengthening health systems and funding um, new global health researchers. Um, as you saw, maybe in the background um, materials, they have trained the uh, they have placed, uh, sorry, <laughs> they are responsible for 70% of new, um, of funding for new vaccines, TB vaccines, um, that comes from European organisations. Um, so that's what makes the possibility of having a new vaccine um, a real one. Um, you will see, I think the case study that was attached to the action materials as well, talks about one mechanism called the European well, it's a bit of a long title, the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership. <laughs> the acronym is EDCTP, um, which makes considerable investments into TB diagnostics. Um, for example, um, they provided operational research into the best diagnostic tool we currently have available called Gene Expert, um, which is a rapid diagnostic test. Previously, it took about well, a few days um, to to get your results back for TB, whereas this this gives you results in a couple of hours, um, and it also can test whether the strain of TB is resistant to any drugs, um, so people are put on the right treatment. So it's really important test, um, and thanks to EU funding that that's being rolled out all all around the world. Um, they're also funding vital uh, 
for vital research into diagnostics for children, um, which it's very hard to diagnose currently uh, TB in children. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so um, let's go over to question three, which I think is coming from the Stort Valley. Yeah, it's me for, for question three. How does the UK being now being outside the UK, EU change how we fund research and development? Uh, thanks, Jill. Um, so currently, we don't quite know how the UK's um, future, what the, the UK's future role will look like, which I think is why this action is really timely and really exciting to try and influence what exactly the UK's role will be in the kind of policy and funding um, roles it currently plays. Um, but up until this point, the UK has been a major contributor um, to, to EU research and development programs, um, as well as a major beneficiary of, of, um, of EU funding. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you will have a university nearby um, that's received, received funding from, from these EU research and development mechanisms. So the one I just mentioned, EDCTP, which luckily is being renamed soon for when it's um, in this year, actually. Um, so the UK is the largest contributor to this, this mechanism. Um, it provides funding for clinical trials that would otherwise not get funding and coordinates research across Europe and Africa. They are, the UK is also the biggest beneficiary of grants from the EDCTP mechanism. Um, so the UK collaborates with 14 European countries and 26 sub-Saharan African countries through this mechanism. Um, and between 2014 and 18, 18 UK research institutions received um, grants totaling over 60 million euros from this mechanism. So UK universities for a lot of their research often are, are reliant on EU funding. Um, so at the moment, these, for example, the EDCTP mechanism, um, it currently runs out in 2020 in its current form, and it's being currently negotiated what, what that will look like next, including what, um, what kind of role the UK will, will play in that. Um, so I think that this month, the action is really kind of necessary to, to say that we think it's really these mechanisms are really important, that we care about them, and that we want the UK to keep prioritising them, in, even though it's going to have a lot of other kind of priorities to be negotiating. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's that. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, I think that's the, where you finished is actually really critically important. Um, even though this is complicated, even though not many people would be, be, be paying attention to it, uh, this is something that if the UK gets right in our negotiations and can continue to engage in, um, we have the potential to really, uh, really continue to do quite a, a lot of good. Um, let's go over to Oxford for question number four to round out the pre-prepared questions. Uh, we have, there we go. Um, why is the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy relevant to our campaign and not differed? So, this is a very short answer. Um, the Department for Business, Energy Industri and Industrial Strategy, or BASE, um, is the government department responsible for the UK's publicly funded scientific research, um, not DFID. So, they work in collaboration with other departments like Department of Health um, and the Medical Research Council supports them also on this work, but they're the ones in charge of the policy for this. Um, the new Secretary of State for, for Bayes is Alok Sharma. Um, so that's, I think, quite lucky for us um, this month because obviously he used to be the Secretary of State for DFID. So hopefully he might be well, well versed in some of the things that we're um, writing to him on. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Um, this, is a, this leaves us in a really good spot. We've got a whole half an hour to dig into this in a lot more depth. And I think we've already seen um, a couple of really good questions come through on the chat box. Um, the, the, let, let's tackle those first. I've also got a question that's come through 
uh, via text as well. So we'll go to that. Anybody else do keep your questions coming. We can, we can work our way through them. So Peter, you've asked uh, what, is a, what is a simple question, but I think doesn't have a simple answer, uh, which is what is the cure rate of XDRTB? And I think before answering that, Rachel, would you be able to take a second and explain to the people, particularly to the people that are new, what on earth XDRTB is? <laughs> yeah, so when we talk about drug resistant TB, um, it means that people's TB is resistant to kind of the, the very best drugs we have available. Um, now, because TB needs to be treated with at least four antibiotics at once, um, the most common form we talk about is rifampicin resistance, which is a key TB drug. But once people are then res resistant to more than, than one or so drugs, they have multi-drug resistant TB. And then they have, if, if they're resistant to even more drugs, it's extensively drug resistant TB or XDR TB. Um, the treatment success rate for MDRTB is 56% currently, and for XDRTB, it's 39%. So very low. You basically and that's wanna... after two years of treatment. Yeah, it's a pretty fierce disease. You do not want to get MDR or XDRTB. Um, and it, that is exactly why we need a bunch more drugs. Um, or a vaccine and better diagnostics. Um, th those sort of those sort of figures are are scary. Um, I, I do remember uh, when I was asked by a parliamentarian uh, in the UK. So if I got it, I, I'd have a much better success ch chance of being cured than and than that, wouldn't I? Because of the NHS. To which I had to say, uh, no, you wouldn't. Those are with the best tools uh, that we have available. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's a really important question. Um, second question in the chat box uh, from Jill to everyone: um, Is it a UK research place that's nearest to getting a new vaccine over the line? Rachel. <laughs> so the the organisations involved with the um, phase two trials, so that's two B, sorry, so the latest trials were GSK, which is a UK based pharmaceutical company, um, and IAVI, which is the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, um, whose clinical trials are running all over the world. Um, I think this one particularly in, in South Africa. Um, and it's been announced only recently that the Gates Foundation research arm would be taking it forward into phase three. So at the moment, Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong, um, I don't think it's clear exactly which partners and which universities Gates will be partnering on for the phase three, the final phase of trials, um, but it could well be um, a UK university. I know that Oxford is very involved with vaccines research, but I'm not sure on this particular candidate. Um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly either. It's a fairly fluid situation, but I think it is it is quite fair to say that with GSK involved, uh, this definitely falls under the purview of the department uh, uh, base uh, in the sense of, uh, you know, the UK is deeply involved in its development. I'm actually just going to drop a link in the chat box that I was researching earlier while Rachel was answering an earlier question. Um, there is a earlier fact sheet on this particular vaccine. If we can find a better one, we'll, we'll put a better link in there a little later on in the chat. But um, there is um, there is an early uh, fact sheet just in, in the chat there for a bit more information. Uh, now let's jump across to one a text that's come in from Deirdre in Poole. Um, uh, 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 Deirdre says, this this was um, potentially before your time, Rachel, so we'll, but we'll see how we get on. Um, it says, uh, some time ago we did work on the situation in Southern Africa on gold mining and tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there an update on how things are there now and specifically whether Anglo gold mining and the other ones that we were campaigning against at the time, have, have put, they put more effort into healthcare for their workers? Um, so I don't know if you want to, uh, if, you, if, you've got, if you've got any updates on that, Rachel. If not, I also did some research on that while you're answering an earlier question and I can throw something in the chat box and say a couple of words. Yeah, so unfortunately, yeah, that, that particular campaign was before my time. Um, but miners have been recognized in recent political declarations, like from the UN high level meeting as a key and vulnerable population that needs to be um, prioritized in the global response. Um, 
people who are minors for anyone else are often more vulnerable for to TB because um, of different particles that are released in, in mining. One's called silico sil silicon, which causes silicosis, which, which um, damages the lungs, making people more vulnerable to TB. But on the specific responses, I know there's, there's a lot of kind of regional initiatives for Southern Africa and others um, looking specifically at, at mining communities. So um, I know there's a lot of regional co cooperation and, and plans and um, that kind of thing, but not anything more specific than that, I'm afraid. Uh which is, oh, sorry if you could hear me typing in everybody, um, uh, which is, I, was, I, I wasn't on mute, um, which is exactly, uh, well, uh, Rachel has nailed it exactly in the sense that I've just pasted a link in the chat box to the World Bank's page on mm. their um, initiatives for programs in Southern Africa for TB in the mining sector. You'll see there's a video, there's all sorts of resources to dig in there. I think one of the key things, um, again, to maybe try and link this back to, uh, again, to the subject of tonight's call around TBR and D. I mean, South Africa is a critically important country for research and development into TB because of uh, the, the amounts of tuberculosis that exist there. It means they, the South African government spending a lot of its own money on TB R and D, but also it's an important place where there are lots of trial sites uh, as well. Um, one of the things that we see is because there's so much uh, uh, so much TB, the, the in infection pressure um, in terms of the germs constantly hitting people can be quite high. And so we really see the need to have a vaccine or better drugs or a better diagnostic there more, really more than more than anywhere. Um, um, go, go ahead. Sorry, Aaron. Just I did in the report Aaron mentioned um, in the introduction um, that I wrote last year, I did actually include a, a section on this, I just forgot. Um, so it talks about South Africa's response to TB um, in the mining sector and it mentions um, a multi-sectoral regional initiative called the Southern Africa TB in the Mining Sector Initiative or the acronym is TIMS, T-I-M-S, um, which aims to address this through uh, establishing occupational health service centers, screening um, models for this specific context, um, conducting studies um, and community system strengthening. And there's a, there's a link um, a footnote, sorry, in the report on that. So it's page 11 of the report. I can paste that in the chat as well um, in case that answers the question. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so let's jump. Let's, I'm just sort of sorting, sorting through. Uh, I've got another question. I've got another question from Peter. Let's leave that for a second and, and go maybe to this one here. Um, uh, um, right. So, uh, Rachel, do you know anything about how the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership uh, works with partners uh, in countries with a high TB burden? Does a portion of the funds that they supply go to African universities, for example? Uh, ooh, sorry, I don't know the specific. We just lost. Sorry, it. I went on mute for some reason. Um, so I don't know the specifics of how much funding, but I'm sure it definitely <laughs> would. Um, I will have to just, maybe I can just quickly look it up and get back to you, but all of the, the trials take place in high burden TB countries. Um, so that would be through universities or at hospitals and the, a lot of training is these, these kind of mechanisms fund a lot of training for African researchers. Um, so I can just try to find out some. Uh, what, what oh, so a... sorry, here, here we are. Um, so over 600 African, um, this just talks about, this is EU support to global health research and innovation. Um, there's, I can share this link maybe as well. There's been over 600 African researchers trained um, Oh, this is specifically EDCTB, sorry. Um, it's 521 African researchers from 2003 to 2015 um, and 90 fellows enrolled. And that's just in its fellowship program. Um, it supports research ethics review and regulatory affairs in 24 sub-Saharan African countries. Um, it funds 102 clinical trials, um, 82 large-scale clinical studies, um, 
and it funds clinical um, capacity in sub-Saharan Africa. So yes, a lot of research institutes, universities, um, and 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 personnel it it trains in, in Africa. And I, and I, that, I think that's great. And I think another thing to note, um, we uh, you were talking earlier about the new tuberculosis vaccine that's under development with GSK and IAVI. I mean, IAVI themselves um, are actually they have a they have a lab over in in London um, in in Chelsea, and. Um, you know, they're really proud of the knowledge and skills transfer that they are making to their southern partners and their southern labs where they're carrying on additional research and development into these things. Um, you know, they're extremely proud of the number of local PhDs uh, and local research um, capacity that's being built, local lab excellence um, with, with labs in places like Zambia uh, and South Africa getting certified to the highest of all international standards. So I think you know, that whole paradigm that we have around research and development being, you know, a, a white, white coated person in a lab in Oxford, uh, it, this just doesn't hold to be what's actually going on with so much research and development with infectious disease all around the world. We have people on, on all continents working on this and, and universities um, from all over the place. And I think that that creation of of, of local infrastructure and local know-how is just a really, really important long-term investment in development. Um, so not just in the immediate challenge of coming up with new tools to fight TB. It's, it's really exciting time, I think. Um, let's jump around. Let's see what else do we have. Um, I'm not gonna, still not going to your question on COVID, uh, Peter. I'll get there eventually. Um, so I've got a question from Macclesfield that this is more political. Um, so let's see if we can read the government's mind. Uh, do we have any idea what the government's thinking to do about EDCTP? Uh, <laughs> is, it, is it a Brexit bargaining chip? Does the government really like it and want it, and want it to stay? Or do they really not care too much about it? Um, we don't actually know exactly what they're thinking, of course. But um, we do know that they, they do like these mechanisms. Um, and support them, but we just don't know how much, I guess, it's on their radar as a priority um, for continuation. But I think the kind of results of these mechanisms do speak for themselves a bit. Um, it's excellent kind of value for money for the UK um, and an opportunity for the UK to maximise its own investments and get a lot back from those investments um, all across the country. Um, so it's definitely within the kind of global Britain lines of, of the UK as well, um, staying part of these, these mechanisms that are having huge global impact um, and working with countries all around the world, especially um, across Africa. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so it looks like somebody else has been jumping on the Google. I think it's Reg from Paul. He's got a, he's got a, a very up to the minute uh, insider question. He says, uh, hi, Rachel. Uh, EDCTP are funding a conference in Amsterdam today with the objective to produce a draft roadmap for TB vaccine R&D. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us more about the conference and have the UK sent a representative to the conference? No, oh, I'm afraid I don't know. Um, I think this vaccines... My impression from the vaccines roadmap that it's being led by WHO. Um, but obviously these mechanisms will all be included in that as kind of key players. So I assume the UK is involved. I can find out tomorrow um, when I meet with David and report back to you. That'd be great. Uh, nothing like up to the minute, uh, mm -hmm. up to the minute until on that. Thanks for the question, Reg. Uh, you're, you're really on the pulse there. Um, let's go to a COVID question. I'm going to go to, uh, to Vicky from Birmingham. Her question reads, uh, with World TB Day coming up, how should we talk to the public about the importance of fighting TB when everybody's scared of coronavirus? Uh, on one hand, comparing them feels like a way to make it real for people. But on mm. the other hand, do we have a worry about distracting from the important COVID messages circulating at the moment? Uh, is any guidance from the World TB Day organizers expected on messaging? And I think that is related to Peter's question. Could COVID-19 make our TB advocacy a mouse squeak in a thunderstorm? How on earth can we compete? Mm. I think um, 
when talking about epidemics and sudden epidemics and needing to be prepared, what we can talk about, and I think this is where R&D is also very relevant, um, is building health systems um, infrastructure, so health systems strengthening. Um, for example, I think many of you all know um, during the Ebola outbreak, I can't remember what year, maybe 2014 or something, um, one of the countries that was able to respond better was Nigeria, and that was thanks to the polio infrastructure that had been, polio vaccine infrastructure that had been built up there. Um, so I think talking about the kind of health systems strengthening um, and is one way to kind of link to the epidemic preparedness and the kind of knock-on effect of having stronger health systems. Um, that means you're ready to, to fight epidemics when they do occur. Um, I have personal opinions on kind of comparing epidemics with epidemics. Um, I've seen a lot of people kind of tweeting, oh, COVID-19 COVID only killed this many people a day. What about TB? kills this many people a day or I personally find it a bit distasteful to <laughs> to do that because I think it takes away um from people suffering from 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 coronavirus but that's obviously up to people's personal kind of um yeah uh take I, on that <laughs> yeah I, yes I, I I agree I mean I I, th I think that's a pretty uh uh I mean uh, comparing suffering is never a good look mm. <laughs> um i i think uh, it's something we try and avoid a lot in results it's it is very easy for us to say certain things uh, around around comparing diseases um and, uh, quite unconsciously but i think you know the last thing we want to do is be um whataboutism or bandwagoning or any of that kind of stuff uh, uh, i i think that we, we do need to be very very sensitive um, people have very real and legitimate fears around COVID-19 and to try and pretend that those fears are completely unfounded is almost surely going to spectacularly backfire, um, even though statistically you're much more likely to die of TV than you are of COVID-19 right now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, living in, living in London. Um, but of course, I would never say that publicly or use that as a, as a talking point uh, in the media right now, um, because uh, it, it wouldn't get the desired result in terms of actually building some sort of sympathy or enthusiasm around TB. It's, it's, it's very, very sensitive. I think also one thing we could talk about, um, one other thing related to research and development, um, for example, in HIV vaccine development, um, the same kind of technologies in early stage research can be applied and used to develop other vaccines. So the same technologies that were being used to try and develop an HIV vaccine were then used to actually develop an Ebola vaccine, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, and the same technologies are kind of being used to um, fight other um, neglected diseases also like snake bites so um the r d that's that's being that's used for one disease is actually applicable for many in the in the earlier stages so there's also that that you could talk about i think um related to r d specifically yeah that's absolutely spot on um now, uh, we've done lots of text messages in the chat and lots of uh, text messages that have gone straight to the phone. I think I've just run out, so we've still got a good 12 minutes, which is great, given the complexity of tonight's topic. We're going to go to the phones. If you haven't had a chance to put in your question, do you want to unmute yourself and yell out your name and where you're from and we'll go to you? Or we can type some more questions in, that's also okay. Is everyone out of questions? This has <laughs> got to be a first. Uh, this has got to be oh, a first. Oh, go, go ahead, Della. Um, is there like a moment that is really memorable for you in terms of learning about TB and like something that really stuck with you? Um, in terms of like knowing why it's important to campaign on TV, TV and do advocacy, or is there like a particular fact or figure that um, sticks with you um, that you use to introduce people to TV? Mm. I think for me, it's 
it's about um just kind of how unfair it is as a as a disease it's the how it affects people who are already marginalized or um people who are just disadvantaged they don't have access to to health services or something and it just seems very unfair for example people who are malnourished or um people with hiv or people who are homeless um and i think it it forces people to make really horrible choices like if they want to be able to travel to the health center to receive tb treatment it means then they don't have enough money to to buy their food or they don't have enough money to um send their child to school so i think it forces really horrible uh, choices for people everywhere um and i think there's one example maybe of of an advocate that uh, aaron and i knew um who was in india his name was dean lewis and he had tb twice um the first time he received treatment um, because he was living with his family and they were able to pay. The second time he had it, he was um, homeless. He had um, issues with addiction. Um, and in order to register for the free treatment through the public health system, he needed a registered address, which he didn't have because he was homeless. Um, so the kind of long-term impact of, how, of suffering from TB meant that he died of complications later on, very early in his life. And I think, yeah, just these kind of um, things that seem really unfair um, is why. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. And thanks for mentioning Dean. I've just, I just actually put a link in the chat box to Dean, uh, a memorial page for Dean uh, from the Stop TV Partnership. His, his story is incredibly compelling. Um, and uh, he was just such an amazing uh, man to work with. And, and really, um, that, that disease gave him a, a really hard time. Um, I think you know what what this so many so many things that Rachel was talking about there do bring us back to the question of why do we need more R and D and and you know, um, you know the fact that you have to be on treatment in the best case for six months mm. um, uh, at the moment is awful. Can you imagine taking tablets that have nasty side effects for six months? Drug resistant TB is two years, fourteen thousand eight hundred mm. tablets. I mean, this is just a colossal amount of chugging these pills and getting injections and so on. We finally have got a breakthrough with new drugs that we no longer need to have in, uh, injectable drugs, which is incredibly good because of the injectable drugs uh, more, quite often made people go deaf, which was a horrible side effect of treatment. So the fact that we've gotten rid of that, at least in theory, um, everywhere, uh, we're still rolling out all the new, new tools and places, but in theory, that should all be gone as good. But still, we have so much more to go there. Um, and, you know, so many of the injustices that Rachel talked about that people experience with TB treatment could be dramatically reduced if we did have new drugs, new diagnostics and a vaccine that was more effective. Um, so, you know, I think that the, the case for this R&D is incredibly compelling. Uh, mm. And as we walk away from the EU, um, it's incredibly important that we don't walk away from the instruments, some of the best instruments that we have to help us get uh, over the line um, with uh, uh, those new tools that, that we need. Um, uh, oh, good. We've got another question. <laughs> oh, hang on. And we, it looks like we've got one in, is this, where is that? London? I'm trying to think. Hello. Oh, sorry. Yes, go ahead. Um, we were talking about the fact that it affects me on the disadvantage and the minorities. So obviously when we're in a place of more privilege, trying mm -hmm. to get people to understand that and to give more, um, more importance to that in their minds can be difficult. So what would you say in approaching that as a topic? I think just relating it back to um to 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 personal stories um which you can find um online or we've written about a few in our reports um and i think people in any country can relate to kind of um a child suffering of tb when they think of their own children or their family um i think some people might use the kind of 
the fact that TB is airborne, so that actually anybody, no matter where you live, just if you breathe, you could catch <laughs> um, TB. So it's actually nobody is actually safe from it, no matter where you live. Um, but yeah, I think always relating back to personal stories, and I think it's something people could um, relate to. I think people who, for example, have been um, sick with with anything um, and struggled to then be uh, under off work and then struggle to get sick pay. I mean, that's something with that TB is, um, people with TB struggle with a lot. For example, in Kenya, where 80% of people work in the informal sector, if they have TB and they need treatment for two years and they can't work, they get no kind of sick pay. And I think that's something that might resonate with people people here as, as well. And um, the kind of economic impact as well as the um, impact on on health is is huge yeah absolutely rachel we sometimes say that tb is both a cause and consequence of poverty uh, it's one of the, the the reasons why we took up work on this about a decade ago well actually more than that i should say about 15 years ago in the first place but precisely because of that that awfully cyclical interrelationship between um, being poor and getting TB and getting TB and staying or, or, or getting uh, poorer as a result. Um, just noticed that in the chat we've had uh, quite a lot of other resources thrown in there um, by Results UK Line 1, which I think is you, Della. Um, there's a great link in there, um, uh, the Vimeo link on how difficult TB treatment itself can be. Um, definitely do watch that. It is a, a very, very powerful um, video and will give you even more evidence as to why we need better treatments. Um, and there's also a link in there on World TB Day resources from the Stop TB Partnership. Uh, so in terms of some of the public campaigning messages. Now, I don't think those have yet been adapted uh, for a, a, a COVID uh, afraid world, um, but it's the because they were produced a couple of months ago before COVID had really blown up. Um, so I think again, you know, asking people to use their judgment and their sensitivity um, if that comes into your messaging at all, but th those resources are definitely there. Um, goodness, uh, I have loads of questions now all of a sudden. We've got three minutes <laughs> left, so let's see uh, if we can we can do this. Uh, oh, Macclesfield, God, you guys are also busy on the Google. Uh, it says Macclesfield, the June 2017 action background sheets available on the results website uh, tell the compelling stories of Fumeza and Enrique, two people from poor countries who had XDRTB, that's extensively drug resistant TB, and had to raise a lot of money and do a lot of traveling to get treatment while being ill. Um, both really, really compelling stories. I think we'll figure out a way to get that into the, the chat box. So thanks for that, Macclesfield. Uh, and then another one from Macclesfield, um, just asking, um, where are the TB hotspots these days? Is it mines in South Africa, prisons in Eastern Europe? What about parts of London? These used to be where it was highest years ago. Uh, where is it now? Hmm. So I think, all of the above, <laughs> um, plus more. So uh, the countries with really high um, but burdens of TB are, are very big countries like India, Pakistan, Nigeria, Indonesia, um, South Africa. So countries also with high rates of HIV, there's often um, a burden of, of both. So that's in a lot of Southern African countries. Um, like you mentioned in, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, um, there's high rates of drug resistant TB um, and like you say it's often in um, particular um, places within those countries for example people are homeless or in prisons or mining sector here in the UK there are about 5,000 cases of TB new cases of TB per year um, and London is a big hot spot um, within the UK um, and largely among the um, homeless population, for example, um, who don't have adequate housing, um, which impacts people's lungs. Um, sorry, I had something else to say on that, but I've completely forgotten. <laughs> so <laughs> carry on. That's okay, Rachel, because we're actually out of time. I'm really sorry, everybody. We've just had a real, a real flurry of stuff come in um, into the in, in on the call. Uh, we've had a request, a uh, very sensible request from Emily. 
Um, if we can get the links from the chat box somehow archived and shared with people. Um, uh, w uh, and uh, Della has replied, we always include them with the blog post containing the recording, which goes on the blog roll uh, of our website. Um, so uh, do, do another reason to visit our website after the fact. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll have uh, all, of that, all of that up there for you to take a look at. And of course, uh, if you rewatch the recording, hopefully I think there's a way of seeing the links and clicking them. I, I don't know that to be true though. Um, uh, Della's nodding, so uh, yeah, great, mm -hmm. very good. Um, look, we're at time, so I, I am really sorry. The last few questions that came out at the last minute, we're not gonna get a chance to get to. Um, but uh, I do wanna say uh, a really, really big thank you to Rachel uh, for sharing all of her expert knowledge of TBR and D uh, with all of us this evening and for making what is, uh, you know, uh, technically a pretty niche and technical topic quite accessible and, and making it uh, quite real. Um, and as I hope is now clear to many of you, this is a particular moment in time where some tightly focused, very specific advocacy could actually help unlock some quite significant resources for the fight against this disease. Um, I do hope that many of you are uh, now equipped uh, to be able to write directly to the business secretary, uh, Alok Sharma, to ensure that research and development for global health, and particularly TB, don't fall off the political agenda during these trade negotiations with the EU. Um, you know, we've been hearing a lot about posturing between two, the two sides this week, and, and the, the worst of all possible outcomes would be if this gets missed unintentionally. Um, because we're not getting the right focus for it in the final deal. Um, as this is a complex issue, uh, I think you may need to refer to our background materials a little more closely than usual, um, but I've read them a couple of times and I, I think they're, they're, they're pretty accessible, so hopefully that's not too difficult. As always, if you need any help deciphering any of that, if you want to check anything with us before you send it off, uh, or just want extra clarity on stuff, do just write into the office. We'll make sure uh, that we answer any of those queries. I think that might be extra homework for Rachel, um, but uh, we'll, we'll get, definitely get that done uh, because it really is the right time to be bringing this to the government's attention. Uh, thank you again, Rachel, um, uh, for joining us. Thank you again, everybody else for joining us, giving up your evenings to tackle this subject. Uh, I've had a, a really uh, good evening talking this through with all of you. I hope you have as well. Good luck with all your advocacy actions. Looking forward to seeing you again on the first Tuesday of next month. That's the 7th of April uh, for the next call. Good night from me and enjoy the rest of your evenings. Thanks. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.